We're going to begin with hymn number 39, please. Hymn number 39, page 191. God moves in a mysterious way. His wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Let's stand as we sing and let's sing it out to the glory of God. Hymn number 39. Let's stand together. still our hearts in the Master's presence together, please. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed as we come before the throne of heavenly grace together. Eternal God and loving heavenly Father, we do thank Thee and we praise Thee that Thou art God. We thank Thee that Thou art Jehovah, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we come before Thee and we say, Holy, 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 Lord God, Almighty. We thank Thee that even as we pray, we know that all three persons of the Trinity are working on our behalf so that we can pray. We thank Thee that we we pray through the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of the Father's dear Son. And we come before the Father bringing our wants and wishes known. And, O God, we come before Thee today, and Thou knowest our, our, our necessity. Thou knowest that we need Thy help even as we come for worship in this hour. Lord, the the devil is busy. The devil is busy to put hindrances and temptations and distractions in our path. But we pray from the outset of this gathering that, that the devil will be put out of the building, off the property, and that he may know that he is a defeated foe. For we are people gathered together to worship the King of kings and Lord of lords. And we ask that every single heart in this gathering at this very moment may have that spirit of old saying, we would see Jesus. And we ask that as we come for worship today, that we would see Christ. And that Christ and Him crucified would be the message that is preached and declared. And, O God, we ask that this would be a blessed, blessed season for our souls, even in the house of our God. But, O Father, we do pray that Thou minister to every need that is gathered into this particular service. Thou knowest as our faces differ, so do our needs, and we pray for those that are not yet saved. O Father, we pray that Thou be pleased to send Thy Holy Spirit and open up their blinded eyes, remove the heart of stone that is often hard and stubborn to the gospel, and replace it with a heart of flesh, 
that is willing to accept Christ as he is, repenting and believing the gospel, we pray that thou crown this service with salvation and redemption, even in this hour. We ask that the people of God may have the privilege of rejoicing with the whole of heaven over one sinner that repenteth. Lord, we pray that thou remember those in a backslidden condition today. Lord, thou knowest the heart. Lord, people may come along and they may dress the part and sing well and listen to the service and, and all of those things, and yet thou knowest the heart. And, O oh God, if there be any that be cold, not walking with thee, not going on as they should be as a believer in Jesus Christ, oh, we pray that thou return them unto the fold today. Show them that the Lord is altogether lovely and that they would once again reestablish that claim, saying, this is my beloved, and this is my friend. O oh God, we pray that thou be pleased to revive the hearts of thine own church and people today. Lord, thou knowest we need a stirring of the Holy Ghost. We know we have the Spirit of God living within us, but how we long for that infilling of the Spirit of God. And O oh Father, we pray that even as we prepare ourselves coming about the word and coming for worship, we pray that thou fill us with thy spirit so that they, then we can leave the house of our God and, uh, and go stand for God for another week, being salt and light, witnesses for the Lord Jesus, going into all the world and preaching the gospel to every creature. Oh God, give us a holy boldness in these dark and evil days. And we pray that thou bless us and help us to be Christ-like in all that we say, think, and do. But, O oh God, as we come before Thee today, this day in particular, when we think of the date, the 17th of March, we thank Thee for the formation of our denomination, the Free Presbyterian Church of Ulster. We thank Thee that 73 years ago Thou didst laid upon the heart of godly men to separate from apostasy, to come from, uh, from within the camp, to come outside of the camp and to stand for God. And we thank thee for those men. And we thank thee for uh, the, the memory we possess of all that they did. We thank thee for Friday night, a man like Dr. Douglas reminding us of those things too. But, O oh God, we pray that thou bless this denomination. We love it and we long to see it going on with thee. We long to see more ground taken for God. And, Lord, we pray thanking Thee for preserving us, even for 73 years, that still, 73 years on, we believe in a born-again communicant membership. Still, 73 years on, we believe in born-again ministers preaching the whole counsel of God. We thank Thee that we believe in, in sola scriptura, scripture alone, as our sole rule of faith and practice. But, O oh God, we do pray that Thou would save us from even little compromises, the little foxes that spoil the vine. And we pray that thou'd help us to, to continue to stand for God, no matter what the cost may be. For we realize this world, we could please this world, but we would only anger and invoke the wrath of God upon his church. Lord, we pray that thou keep us, keep us preaching the blood and the book in these days and help us to, to plow a straight furrow for God, not turning to the left hand or to the right hand, Help us to be faithful. But, O oh God, we just come before Thee now and we pray that Thou remember those that can't be with us as well today in our church family. Remember those that are sick. Remember those that are feeling the infirmity of the years. Bless those that are shut in or in the nursing home or in the hospital ward. We pray that Thou would undertake for them and encourage them in the Lord. But, O oh God, we remember those that aren't here and they could be here as well. They should be here. We pray that thou challenge their souls toward that matter too. But, O oh God, help us now. Help us in everything that we say, think, and do in this worship hour uh, to bring all of the glory, all of the honor unto Christ our King. We pray that sola ideo gloria may be our theme to the glory of God alone. Hide man behind the cross. Exalt thine own dear Son. For we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his eternal glory. Amen. Hymn number 38, please. Hymn number 38, page 190. Oh, what matchless condescension the eternal God displays, claiming our supreme attention. 
to his boundless works and ways, his own glory, his own glory, he reveals in gospel days. Number 38, standing as we sing. Let's stand together. Turning in the Word of God together, please, to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28. If you're using a church Bible in the pew in front of you, you'll find it on the page 997, page 997. But Matthew, chapter 28, we're going to read the whole of this chapter, all 20 verses. In a moment, we're going to take as our our text, our theme, the verse 19. And we're continuing on with our series, our study, uh, Great Doctrines of the Bible. Great Doctrines of the Bible. And we've looked at how God reveals himself. We've looked at Scripture alone, or Sola Scriptura. Uh, We've looked at what God is. And then today, God willing, we're looking at the Trinity. The Trinity. And the Word of God has a lot to say about the Trinity And I will just give you warning right from the outset that the Trinity is a doctrine that we will never fully comprehend. We can't because we are not God. But nonetheless, the Scriptures teach it. We're going to look at what the Scriptures teach and therefore we have a duty to believe it. But Matthew 28, will you read this tremendous resurrection chapter, the Lord's resurrection from the dead and then what he has to say after his resurrection. Matthew 28 and the verse 1. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. 
And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulchre with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole them away while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews." Until this day. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. And we trust the Lord will bless the public reading of his holy and precious word to each of our hearts. Now at this point in the service, let me bid each one a very, very warm welcome to the house of God. And please do remember today that today is the 73rd anniversary of our denomination and I trust that even today as the people of God we will continue to pray that the Lord will preserve us and bless us and help us to keep a steady course for the next 73 years and beyond that we would ever be faithful unto the Lord as the Lord tarries. But we welcome you all to the house of God today and we welcome those visiting with us as well, the Brown family and also Miss Douglas here and anyone else that's maybe visiting with us as well. And we bid you a very warm welcome in the Saviour's name. Please remember the gospel service tonight at 7 p.m. That's preceded by a half hour of prayer at 6.30. And tonight we're going to be looking at the title, The Gospel That the Free Presbyterian Church of Ulster Preaches. The Gospel That the Free Presbyterian Church of Ulster Preaches. And we're going to look a little more at our history and what we do preach to this dark and sinful world. But for the week ahead of us on Monday is the LTBS TV recordings. Uh, the sessions are at 8 p.m. and 9 p.m. And I would encourage all those that signed up. And even if you didn't sign up and you'd still like to come, there'll be room for you. Please be at Lurgan Free Church by 7.30. We need you there at least half an hour before. But the bus will be leaving here at 7 p.m. sharp. And it will be sharp to get down there for that time or, or thereabouts. But please remember that. Please do come if you're able. Then on Wednesday, our Bible study and prayer meeting at 8 p.m., uh, continuing on with our series in the book of James. And then on Friday, the Youth Fellowship at 8 p.m., Mr. Jonathan Jordan, a student of the Whitfield College of the Bible, will be coming along to preach the word. And then this coming Friday is also a late night men's prayer meeting, 10 p.m. through to 11 p.m. Just for the gentlemen, let me say that it always was the last Friday of the month. Now it's going to be the second the last Friday of the month, but I'll announce it week by week as it comes anyway, and you'll know. But the late night men's prayer meeting, uh, 10 till 11 p.m. on Friday night. Then the services next Lord's Day, our Sabbath school and Bible class at 10.45. I would encourage as many as possible to come for that earlier season. Then our morning worship at 12 noon, 
The evening gospel service at 7 p.m., both of those meetings preceded by a half hour of prayer. Now, today is our Whitfield College Covenant offering, so if you can, please do support the work of the college. And then next Lord's Day, uh, we don't ordinarily have a special offering next Lord's Day, but this time we're going to have a special retiring offering to endeavor to encourage uh, Andy and Jill Foster in Penticton. And that will be an offering to encourage them as individuals. But I trust you'll remember that and give generously. The servants of God out there have done a work for the Lord for many, many years. Uh, And let's continue to pray for them and let's encourage them if we can. Uh, That's a special retiring offering next Lord's Day. Now our next committee meeting for the deacons is due for Monday the 25th of March at the slightly later time of 830 Any items for the agenda need to be submitted to the secretary, Mr. Andrew Bell, before Saturday, please. Then just some dates for the diary. We've been announcing uh, about those interested in baptism. Uh, Well, we have a date for you. A baptismal service is planned for Friday, the 14th of June uh, this year at 8 p.m. in our Bambridge Church. And there are a good number of you have said that you would like to be baptized. So that's Friday, the 14th of June. And if there's anybody else that hasn't yet indicated that they would like to be baptized, then please do speak with myself or one of the elders and we will add your name to the list. Also, uh, some more dates for the diary. We're planning on having a week of teaching meetings uh, on the end times with the Reverend David McMillan. And the dates for those are Sunday night, the 23rd of June, through to Friday night, the 28th of June. And I trust you'll be in prayer concerning that and that you'll plan on attending as well. Just to remind parents that uh, we still need consent forms in for the Youth Fellowship and the Sabbath School. Please do get them in as quickly as possible. But please do continue to pray for the sick and the shut-in and those that have been bereaved of late Please remember them all before the throne, but all these announcements are subject to the will and mind of the Lord. But we're going to have our offering hymn now, hymn number 44, hymn number 44, page 193. Mighty God, while angels bless thee, may immortal sing thy name, Lord of men, as well as angels, thou art every creature's theme. Lord of every land and nation, ancient of eternal days, Sounded through the wide creation, be thy just and endless praise. We'll keep our seats while our tithes and offerings are collected for the work of God in this place. Hymn number 44.
stand as we sing verse 1 and verse 4, but let's stand together. Verse 1 again. tremendous singing silent i can never be for salvation's wonder story praise eternal praise to thee now we're turning in the word of god again to matthew chapter 28 please matthew chapter 28 and we're taking as our text the verse 19 if you're using a church bible you'll find the text on page 998 but Matthew 28 and the verse 19, we're looking at the doctrine of the Trinity today. The Trinity. And this is just an overview, but nonetheless, as is our form in Monash Lane, there will be many references to turn to, so I trust you'll have your Bible ready and turn to each reference if you can. And we're here to study the Word of God together. Matthew 28 and the verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Let's bow in a word of prayer together. Let's ask for the Lord's help and his blessing. Heavenly Father, we come before thee. And Lord, thou knowest the topic we have before us to preach. Lord, there are so many great topics in the Word of God, and yet surely there is no greater topic than the topic of who our God really is and the Trinity of God. Oh, Father, we pray that Thou would give us hearts that understand and give us ears that are willing to hear. Lord, we ask that Thou bless us from Thy truth today and help us, we plead, to catch a glimpse of who our God is we ask these things in the Saviour's lovely name. Amen. There are many in this world that try and deny the doctrine of the Trinity. And you'll know who some of those characters are. You think of, uh, suppose, the main cults that we would term them, term them. You think of the Russellites. You say, who are they? Well, they will call themselves Jehovah's Witnesses. I don't like calling them Jehovah's Witnesses, for they're not the witnesses of Jehovah, they're Russellites, Russellites, because they were formed as a false religion by Charles Taze Russell. They don't believe that Jesus Christ is God. They don't believe in the Trinity. You think of the Mormons. Now, they will try and call themselves the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints. They're not anything of the sort. They're Mormons, and they were formed by a man by the name of Joseph Smith, and they deny the Trinity. They deny that Jesus Christ is God. But then there are some that are a little closer to home as well, and they are the Unitarians, and you'll know some of those names. You'll know uh, names like the non-subscribing Presbyterian Church. They're Unitarians. And even though the name Presbyterian may be in their name, the term non-subscribing means they don't subscribe to the Westminster Confession of Faith, or Reformed Theology, and they don't subscribe to the Trinity. They don't believe that Jesus Christ is 
actually God. Now, I would argue this point. In order to be a true Christian, you must believe that Jesus Christ is God. You must believe that Jesus Christ is God. I'll say that again because it is a very important statement. In order to be a true Christian, you must believe that Jesus Christ is God. Therefore, I have no problem in saying that Unitarians, JWs, or Russellites, Mormons, anyone else that denies who Jesus Christ really is, they cannot be Christians. They cannot be saved. And they are people that we need to reach with the gospel. You must believe that Jesus Christ is God to be a Christian. Now, the Bible teaches that there is one God. There is one God, Jehovah, and that he exists in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, that he is three in one and one in three. And I'm going to be very honest with you from the very beginning, as I've already said, this is a subject that is hard to understand, not going to bluff you in any way. It is a subject that is hard to understand, and yet I argue this point, the Bible teaches it, so we believe it. It's as simple as that, friend. The Bible teaches it so that we believe it. And it's hard to understand for a very simple reason, because the Trinity is to do with an infinite God, a God without boundaries, a God without limitations, a God without measure. And you and I are finite. We're the opposite. We are weak, we are feeble. We are limited in our knowledge and understanding. Therefore, we will never fully comprehend who God is. And we will never fully comprehend the Trinity, yet the Bible teaches it, so we believe it. Come with me to Genesis chapter 1 and the verse 1, if you would, please. And I want you to note something very interesting, that actually we find that the doctrine of the Trinity is one of the very first doctrines taught in your Bible. And we find it, the doctrine of the Trinity, in the fourth word of our Bible. Isn't that incredible? Four words into the Bible, you find the Trinity. And you say, really? I know this verse. I learned this verse as a a memory verse in the gospel bus meeting or Sabbath school. or, Or I know this verse. Do you really see the Trinity here? Well, let's see. Genesis chapter 1 and the verse 1, it says, In the beginning, God. God created. Now, you see that, that word, that noun, God. In the original Hebrew, it's the word Elohim. And it's written in the plural. Isn't that incredible? You say, I'm not really good at a plural or singular or tenses or grammar or things like that. That's saying that the God, even though he is one, he is a plurality of persons. There are, there are different persons existing within that name. In the beginning, God in the plural created. And at the very fourth word of our Bible, we find three persons created. God the Father... God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Elohim, written in the plural. And then look at the verse 26 of Genesis chapter 1. And we see it further, that there's a plurality of persons in God within that sense that that have created. Look at the verse 26, it says, And God said, and look what it says now, written in the plural, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let him have dominion over the fish and over the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man. But you say, look at these words. And every word of God is pure, by the way. So every word is there for a reason. Look at the verse 26. Let us, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now, you don't talk like that in the singular. If I am going to do something, if I am going to get in my car and drive to the shops, I would say, let me or or, let I do something. I I talk in the singular, but I don't talk in the plural. Let us or are. There's a reason for that. Because right at the beginning of our Bible, we find that there is the Trinity, that within Jehovah the Godhead, there is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we find this in our Bibles further through as well. Come with me to Isaiah chapter 48. 
Isaiah 48 and the verse 16. And as we then go through our Bibles, we then find who, who this plurality of persons are. The Word of God, as it progresses, and we are given progressive revelation, more and more is revealed to us over time. We find out who these particular persons are. We find it is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, or, or the Holy Ghost, as he's sometimes called in our Bible too. And in Isaiah 48 and the verse 16, we find that even though there is only one God, there is uh, three distinct persons within the Trinity. And here we find the Spirit designated as distinct from the Father and the Son. In Isaiah 48 and verse 16, look at it with me. It says, Come ye near unto me, hear ye this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning, from the time that was there am I, and now the Lord God and his Spirit had sent me. So we find now the Spirit is denoted as a, as a distinct person in that sense, one of the persons of the Trinity. Come with me to John chapter 10. John chapter 10 and look at verses 30 and 31. And here we find now the Son distinct from the Father, yet all three are one God, one God Jehovah. And our feeble minds struggle to understand this. But we don't need to understand it. We just need to believe it. Because the Bible tells us it. And John 10 and the verse 30 says this. This is the Lord Jesus speaking. He says, I and my Father are one. So you find just from two references in our Bible, we know who, who this us and are uh, speaking about in Genesis 1. We find the Spirit is mentioned. We find Jesus Christ speaks as I or the, or the Son. And we find he mentions the Father. And look at the verse 31 here. The Jews knew exactly what he was talking about. As verse 31, it says, Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. They knew that he was claiming to be God. They knew what the claim was. Otherwise, they wouldn't have tried to assassinate him, stone him, martyr him. They, they knew what he was saying. Sadly, many of us fail to see it. And then you see it in John 3 in the verse 16, and you know these words off by heart. I would imagine most of you, for God so loved the world that he gave, gave, gave his only begotten Son, the Son. So we find there are three distinct persons in the Trinity, all one God. And the Word of God is very clear on this. And come with me to Matthew 28 again, back to our main verse that we read the chapter of. And the verse 19, that's why the Lord speaks. And the Lord tells when the disciples are baptizing, and they're baptizing, they're to baptize in the name of God, and in the name of God baptizing, they baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now, if you're looking for verses to try and prove the Trinity, maybe you do have a Russellite wrap your door and say, I don't believe in the Trinity. I don't believe that Jesus Christ is God. Well, there's various verses you could turn to. Matthew 28, verse 19 is one, that there clearly is a, a trinity, three persons in the Godhead. Come with me to Luke chapter 3. And these are verses that mention all three persons at once as God doing and performing something. Look at Luke 3 and verses 21 and 22 with me. And I warn you, there is plenty of references to look at, but important that we look at it. We're here to, here to study the Word of God. And it says in Luke 3, 21 and 22, Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was open, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him, and the voice and a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. And we find in the verses there to do with the Lord's baptism, we find God the Son present, we find God the Holy Spirit descends, and we find God the Father speaks from the heavens too. All three persons of the Trinity in one place. Come with me to Luke chapter 1 and the verse 35. We read here concerning the virgin birth the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we find that all three persons were involved in that miracle of miracles. It says in the verse 35 of Luke 1, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost. So you see, 
They're one of the persons of the Trinity. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. There we find God the Father. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. There's a third person of the Trinity, all mentioned together in one verse. And there are so many verses like it, friend. I'll just give you a few more, but you don't need to turn to them. In 2 Corinthians 13 and the verse 14, we read the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all, all mentioned in the one verse. 1 Peter 1 and the verse 2, it talks about salvation. Listen to this, it says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctification of the Spirit unto the obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. We find the word of God is, is full full to the brim, of this doctrine of the Trinity. And it is a thoroughly biblical doctrine. We don't just hold to it because the early church held to it or, or some professor with highfalutin degrees told us to. We believe it because the Bible teaches it. We believe it because the Word of God states it, that there is one God in three persons, all with distinct roles. And and you'll know, some of you, the shorter catechism, it says, how many persons are there in the Godhead? And to sum all this up, it says, there are three persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one God, the same in substance, equal in power and glory. So today, I want us to look at the three persons of the Trinity, the three persons of the Godhead. Number one today God the Father. God the Father. Who is God the Father? God the Father is the first person of the Trinity. The first person of the Trinity. And God the Father is the name applied to the first person of the Trinity in the Scriptures because of his relation to the second person of the Trinity. Because of the name God the Son, Jesus Christ, he is God the Father. And let me also say that this is a thoroughly scriptural name. Come with me to John chapter 1, please. John chapter 1, and look at the verse 14. And we find that to call the first person of the Trinity, the first person of the Godhead, to call him God the Father, is a, a scriptural name. There's a reason why we, we give him that title, that name, because the scriptures do. John 1 verse 14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. Look at it now. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So we find that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and God, the first person of the Trinity, is, is God the Father. Turn to, to the verse 18 of John 1. It says, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. It's a scriptural name. Turn over a few more pages to John chapter 8. John chapter 8, and look at the verse 54. Verse 54, it is a scriptural name. And we read here, John 8 and the verse 54. It says, Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Turn over a few more pages to John 14 and verses 12 and 13. I know there's a lot of references, but I make no apology for it. We must see this is the word of God teaching these things. Chapter 14, verse 12 and verse 13 it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So something I just want to highlight, everyone looking this way a moment, I know we've looked at a lot of references there. Something I want to highlight, you will hear on the radio, television, maybe even in the flesh. I hope you never have the misfortune of hearing it in the flesh yourself. But you'll hear apostates and compromisers trying to bring in, especially a sort of sodomite trans lobby, this idea of mother God or, or, or no gender type God. I, I want to say this. God 
deliberately uses masculine pronouns to describe himself. And who are we to dispute with Almighty God? It is not God mother or God sister or God daughter or anything like that. It is God the Father, God the Son. They are the names that God has given himself in his word. Therefore, that is what we call him. And what does the Father do? What does the Father do? Well, to put it very simply, God the Father planned. He planned. He planned creation. He planned providence. He, he planned redemption. He planned everything. He planned everything. Come with me to Ephesians chapter 1. We see this. And in Ephesians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul is, is writing to the church at Ephesus. And the first thing he wants to do is remind them that it is God the Father that is to be praised for all that he did even prior to creation being done, even prior to providence, the governing of all things being in place, even prior to redemption being complete upon the cross and the Spirit saving our souls. God the Father is to be praised for all that he did. Essentially everything was born in the heart of God the Father. And it says in Ephesians 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God, look at it, and Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's who we're talking about now. The first person of the Trinity, God the Father. And look what it says, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he, who are we talking about? Talking about God the Father. According as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children. How can we be the children of God? Well, we are the children of God the Father. Unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according, uh, according to the good pleasure of his will. I want you to know that God the Father planned everything, chose his people from before the foundation of the world, chose to, to, to make creation, chose to, to govern it and sustain it in a certain way according to his providential will, planned redemption, controls everything, controls everything. That's God the Father. But then secondly, God the Son. God the Son. Who is God the Son? God the Son is the second person of the Trinity the second person of the Trinity. And let me say that the second person of the Trinity is called God the Son because of his relation to the first person of the Trinity, God the Father. And he's called God the Son. Now, this is something that is hard for us to understand. It is hard for us to understand, but I want to try and make it as clear as possible. You and I are used to something. You and I are used to a father being older than a son, aren't we? We're used to a father being maybe 20, 30, maybe 40 years older than their son. But that is not the case here with Almighty God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit have always existed. There has never been a beginning. One was not there before the other. They were all one and always have been and always will be. And there is no gap or, or lap or time lapse or anything like that. All existed at the same time and have always existed. And God the Son is eternally begotten of the Father. Okay? Eternally begotten. Always existed. Always been there. Always been there. As long as God the Father has been there. Always eternally begotten. But he is nonetheless designated as the Son. Come with me to John chapter 1. Again, John chapter 1, and look at the verse 1. Because we see this, that God, the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, has always existed, has always been there, has always been there as long as God the Father has been there, and that has been always and forever throughout all eternity, past, present, and future. And John 1 and the verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word. That's the Lord Jesus Christ was the Word, or Jesus Christ. And the Word, Jesus Christ, was with God. And the Word, Jesus Christ, was God. The same was in the beginning 
with God. But then look at the verse 14 again. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now the word is talking about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But John 1 and the verse 1 is very important. There has never been a time when God the Son did not exist. There's never been a time when God the Father did not exist. There's never been a time when God the Holy Spirit did not exist. They are all inseparably linked as one God, Jehovah. But it is a scriptural title, again, to call Jesus Christ the Son of God. We see it there, John 1 verse 14, the only begotten of the Father. He's a son. John 3 verse 16, we read of him as uh, the only begotten Son. We read of him calling himself, many's a time, the Son of God. Now, what does the Son do? What does the Lord Jesus Christ do when it comes to the grand scheme of things in, in the Godhead? So God the Father planned everything. What does God the Son do? Well, God the Son mediates everything in that sense. He, he actually puts the thing into action. We could say God the Son was there a creation, creating. God the Son is involved in, in providence, in running everything, still sustaining this world and the universe. God the Son is the one that purchased redemption with his own blood. God the Son is the one that mediates, or the word mediates means bring about something. He's the one that brings it about. The plan is of the Father and the Son. He's the one that procures it, brings it about, mediates it. Now let's just look at this a moment. Come with me to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. I want you all to turn here because there's a few verses I want you to see in Colossians 1. In Colossians 1 and verses 12 and 13, we read that it is God the Son, God the Son that, that mediates, brings about, procures creation. God the Father planned it, but God the Son actually was the one that spoke all things into existence. Colossians 1 and the verse uh, 12 says, Giving thanks unto the, uh, unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. So listen, it's the Son that we're talking about now. It's the Son that Colossians 1 is referring to. Now look at verses 16 and 17. For by him, Jesus Christ, were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. It's very clear. Who created everything? Jesus Christ created everything. Who sustains everything? In the providence of God. You see, God didn't just create everything and then just abandon creation to do its own thing. God is involved in this world. In providence, he governs it, runs it. That's why we can say in Romans 8, all things work together for good for the believer. We know because God still runs this world in that sense. Look at the verse 17. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. We find that is Jesus Christ, the Colossians 1 is talking about. But also, look at the verse 14. It was Jesus Christ that, yes, uh, caused everything, brought about creation, brought about providence, if you will, but brought about redemption as well. Look at the verse 14. In whom? In Christ, in his dear Son, as the verse 13 says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of of sins. Now, everyone looking this way a moment, I want to make something perfectly clear that Jesus Christ died and died for sinners. Maybe you're here today and you say, well, well, you're covering a lot of heavy stuff. And I know that. But I think it's important that as believers we know it, we understand it, we love it and get a grasp of it. We should be on the meat of the word. But if there's one here and you're not yet saved, I want you to understand this. And I want you to listen to me well as I say it. The Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, the one that created all things and governs all things, it is he that humbled and humiliated himself and came to this wicked world of ours and died. Died in our room instead. Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for sinners. 
Christ died for souls in Monash Lane. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I want you to note that the greatest and the crowning work of the second person of the Trinity was his redemptive work, dying upon the cross, shedding his precious blood so that sin could be forgiven, so that justice could be done, so that all the demands of a righteous God could be met and could be satisfied. And you say, well, how do I know that when Christ died, he died for me? How do I know that the blood that was shed, it was shed for me? How do I know that I'm a Christian and I can be saved today? How do I get to that point? Well, Mark 1 and the verse 15 says, Repent ye and believe the gospel. Repent ye and believe the gospel. That's how you're saved, friend. By rejecting your sin, forsaking your sin, turning away from your sin, and being sorry for your sin and coming to Christ, believing that when he died, he died for you. The crowning work of the Son of God was bringing about redemption, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Then I want you to note the last person of the Trinity. We've noted something of God the Father, something of God the Son. Thirdly, God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit. We read in our text that when baptizing... The one baptizing the uh, believer, in my view anyway, but anyway, ought to do so in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. Now, God the Holy Spirit proceeds, proceeds from God the Father and God the Son. By the way, as I've already emphasized, God the Holy Spirit has always been there's never been a point when he didn't exist, when he wasn't there. God the Holy Spirit has always been, always there. And something we forget, that all three persons of the Trinity are equal in power and substance. There is not one more powerful than the other in that sense. And I want you to note that. Often, I feel, especially in Reformed circles, we, we can at times forget about the Holy Spirit. That's maybe a knee-jerk reaction to... Pentecostal charismatic types have put far too much emphasis on the Holy Spirit and, and gifts and things like that. But listen, we are not to forget the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit does a vital, vital work. He is a person of the Godhead too. We must remember him. Come with me to John 15, please. John 15, he proceeds from the Father and the Son. Now, that is a biblical phrase. That is a biblical terminology. Because we read it here, John 15 and the verse 26. And it tells us very clearly the relationship between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, all one God, Jehovah. And it says, John 15, verse 26, But when the Comforter is come, that's another name for the Holy Spirit, by the way, when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, so we find the Lord Jesus sending, from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me, and ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. Now, the Holy Spirit. In our Bibles, we read of the Holy Spirit doing all sorts of things. We read of the Holy Spirit speaking. We read of the Holy Spirit searching. We read of the Holy Spirit testifying. To certain things. We read of the Holy Spirit commanding, commanding, giving authoritative orders, things we should do. We read of the Holy Spirit revealing, most notably in His Word, in the Bible. It is the Holy Spirit that has allowed us to have a Bible today and to know anything about God. There's the Holy Spirit that strives with sinners. In Genesis we read, my spirit shall not always strive with man. The Holy Spirit strives. Maybe the Spirit is striving with you today. You know you need to be saved. You must be saved. You must be in time. And to date you've been continually, continually rejecting Him. But the Holy Spirit strives. And the Holy Spirit makes intercession. But if we were to say generally, what does the Holy Spirit do? What does He do? 
If we were to sum it all up in one word, I'd say the Holy Spirit completes, completes. So God the Father planned, God the Son brought it about, and then God the Holy Spirit completes the work in the heart of the believer. He applies it to us. He applies it to us. Now in creation, we read of the Holy Spirit applying and, 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 and completing things. We read in Genesis 1 of the Holy Spirit moving upon the waters. In Job 26 in the verse 13, you don't need to turn to it, but it says, by his Spirit he hath garnished the heavens, the Holy Spirit doing that tremendous work. We read of the Holy Spirit involved in the virgin birth, in that sense, putting that completing or finishing aspect to it in Luke chapter 1 and the verse 35, when it says, the Holy Spirit shall come upon thee. But in redemption, how does the Holy Spirit work? Come with me, everyone coming with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Now in this portion, in Ephesians 1, a tremendous portion, by the way, if you're going to try and prove the Trinity in your Bible, you read of God the Father planning everything. We've already noted that. We read of God the Son uh, creating the circumstance of redemption by dying upon the tree, shedding his precious blood, being that, that substitute and that sacrifice. And it says in the verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. But what about God, the Holy Spirit, in redemption? Well, let's see. Look at verses 13 and 14 of Ephesians 1. The Holy Spirit has a tremendous work. It says, In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed. Look at it. Ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Look at Ephesians 4 and the verse 30. Chapter 4 and the verse 30, just over the page, it says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let me put it like this as we finish. Everyone looking this way again. God the Father planned redemption, chose us from before the foundation of the world. That's what Ephesians 1 says. Uh, God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ, He actually died, made it possible. The blood was shed, justice was done. Everything needed was done upon that tree 2,000 years ago. But then what is the Holy Spirit's role in redemption? Well, you say, well, that happened 2,000 years ago. How would we know about the cross? I tell you why, because the Holy Spirit has revealed it to us in the Word of God. But not only that, you know, in a meeting such as this, or in a gospel meeting, or a time when a soul is convicted of their sin, why is that the case? Because the Holy Spirit is showing them their sin. Why is it that a sinner then feels compelled to repent and believe the gospel? I'll tell you why. Because the Holy Spirit is compelling them in their heart. You must repent. You must believe the gospel. Why is it that a soul is finally saved? I'll tell you why. Because the Holy Spirit has applied it and sealed redemption in the soul. Why am I saved today? I'm saved because God the Father planned it. I'm saved because Christ the Son he died for me, but I'm saved today because God, the Holy Spirit, applied it all to my heart in reality. All three persons of the Godhead working together to bring about this tremendous end of bringing God's people unto himself. God the Father planned it. God the Son procured it. God the Holy Spirit completes it. All that was required was done. And all three persons of the Trinity had a role to play. Come with me as we finish to 1 Peter 1 and the verse 2. 1 Peter 1 and the verse 2. And this is maybe the greatest of verses in summing up how all three persons of the Trinity worked together, worked in harmony, and worked to this one goal of redeeming a people. And 1 Peter 1 and the verse 2 talks about it. It says, elect, it's God's people, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. So there we find the planning of the Father. 
through sanctification of the Spirit, through the applying work of the Spirit, and look at it, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace be multiplied. Friend, something I just want you to understand today, we serve a triune God. And even though we may not ever, not even in the glory, fully comprehend it, for we are not God, we must believe it because the Scriptures have revealed it to us. And let us thank God for who He is. Thank Jehovah that He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And how thankful we are that all three persons of the Trinity worked so that we could be redeemed. We could be called the sons of God. We could have heaven as our home. Maybe there's one here and you're not yet saved. Well, friend, know this. You can be saved today. If only you come to God God's way, turning from your sin, believing on Christ alone. And then with any other that is here that is a saved individual, you can be thankful for all that was done because of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Trust the Lord to bless his word to each of our hearts for his own namesake. Hymn number 32 as we finish. Hymn number 32. And this is a tremendous old hymn in the section of the hymn book to do with the Trinity. Hymn number 32, page 188. Father of heaven, whose love profound a ransom for our souls hath found. Before thy throne we sinners bend. To us thy pardoning love extend. And here in this hymn we read something of all three persons of the Trinity. And then the verse 4 says, Thrice Holy Father, Spirit, Son, Mysterious Godhead, three in one. Before thy throne we sinners bend. Grace, pardon, life to us. Extend. We'll stand as we sing hymn number 32. Let's stand together. Father, we come before Thee and we thank Thee for Thy dear Son. We thank Thee for Thy Holy Spirit that has applied redemption to our hearts. And we pray, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, grace, pardon, and life to us now extend. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.